Mike, would you buy Boston beer? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, really. I mean, who wouldn't? I, we'll I get it. Did I take a check? Like a. <laughs> <laughs> just a just a check from your checkbook. Yeah, I got. Yeah, I'm sure you'll care. Uh, yeah, sure. I got a. I still have a check from college. Actually, my college roommate. Uh, we were well. I mean, it's like we were drunk all the time. But one specific night we were drunk. I got him to write me a check for a gazillion dollars. <laughs> <laughs> I still have it. I'm you gonna, think you can catch that still? Yeah, I'm not even sure that we have the a gazillion. Is technically a denomination yet? But uh, as soon as it's a denomination, I'm going to try to cash it. He, I'm pretty sure he won't have a gazillion dollars at that time. But if those two things come together, if Kurt gets really rich and a gazillion becomes an official denomination, I'm rich, bitch. Well, we're going to get into more about how Mike's going to buy Boston beer in a bit. But first, the booze news. In beer news. Actually, let me back up a second and let you all know it's going to be a long episode. Tons of stuff happened this week. It's going to be a lot of fun, but just dig in, get yourself a second pint because we're here for you and you're going to be here for us. Now, the also, booze it's news. two o'clock in the afternoon and I haven't been sober since five o'clock yesterday. So <laughs> it might be Ander. <laughs> Sometimes we have those weeks, folks. Now, in beer news, there is a brewery out of the UK that is making a line of beers named after dictators, and surprise, surprise, they have been selling out. We're talking about the latest release, which is Osama Bin Lager. <laughs> oh, it sounds tasty. This is coming off the backs of Kim Jong Ale. Kim Jong Ale? Yep, and That's Putin cute. Porter. Yeah. And so they've uh, they've Bin been Laden. I mean, Bin Laden was not a dictator. He was just a credible just a terrorist. Dick. He was just a dick. He yeah, was. I don't know. I don't. Where get it. where is your criminal line there? I mean, uh, is like the serial killer line. The, you know, uh, Bundy. Uh, Whatever, I guess all of this is all like no, that's good. Brandy, hey, bourbon. I whatever, can tell you're on your game you know today, Mike. You're very sharp, <laughs> very sharp right now. As someone said on X, formerly known as Twitter, quote, <laughs> God damn it, <laughs> this is the sort of thing you'd see, chuckle, and buy something else of. And I have to say, I agree. Yeah, I mean, I'm not gonna get bent out of shape over it. I don't care. They're kind of cute names, but um. If you're calling your stuff a Osama Bin Lager, you're not built for the long term. Probably this is not, not going to be a heritage no. brand of the UK 200 no. years from now. They're not going to be yeah. crushing OBLs, you know? <laughs> Absolutely. You're, yes. But do I, like, respect it less than who farted out of uh, Columbus? Mm. Uh, no. Yeah, actually, I can't say which one I respect less. And I'm actually right. kind of leaning towards respecting who farted less. Yeah, just me because too. Um, it's more lowbrow and stupid. Yeah, but they're both lowbrow and stupid. Yeah, but I mean, yeah, Osama bin Lager is a. Uh, I there's kind of balls in that, right? Well, you know what my I mean, favorite joke of my two and a half year old is right now? It is poop and fart jokes. Yeah, it is yeah. poops and fart jokes. Yeah. Papa, I farted. Papa, I tooted. Mm. Poo poo pee pee. Papa, that's what she says. Yeah. That cracks her up. You know what she doesn't mm -hmm. say? Osama bin farthead. <laughs> right. So, just on a level of intelligence, yeah. we're maybe a yeah. quarter of a step up. So, yeah, yeah. I guess you're right. She's not making Putin references. <laughs> <laughs> Pooping Putin. <laughs> Rip. <laughs> And, uh, if you're I just still, got a great. I just got a good, good, great idea for a new fiber. <laughs> <laughs> if you're still with us, thank you. We got plenty of good Sorry. stories continuing to come up. This is gonna be a good one. Now, this next is on spectacular. It really is. Archetype Brewing special shout out. We don't usually do these. Uh, now, in the UK, continuing UK beer news. In the U.S., we have, uh, you know, trades and measures and weights department and stuff. It's the auditor basically takes care of all that. Yeah. That way, if you buy a gallon of fuel, you know you're getting a gallon of fuel. Right. Well, in the U.K., they take this shit extremely seriously for everything, including beer. Your pint of beer is regulated by the government to be exactly a pint. And they did an audit this past week in the UK, and they found out the average UK citizen is getting 114 pounds stolen from them through short pours by their pubs. That's equal to 24 pints of beer they're getting shorted. 
But how do you per consider a uh, short pour? I mean, like, if, if are, are you counting the head in that pour? That's the beauty of the UK beer glass as well. All of their beer glasses are designed with a liquid level line that is well below the ah, top of the glass, so like you have plenty of room. Glass, except they exactly. Yeah, yeah, you have a, uh, twenty uh, ounces is about an inch below the top of the glass, mm -hmm. so you get plenty of head. You get plenty of liquid. Everybody wins, except for certain pubs selling beer and wine for less than what they're but advertising. But you as the consumer can see it. Yes. It's your fault. You're not saying, <laughs> what the fuck? <laughs> Maybe Where, it's, where's the rest of my beer? Maybe it's just that UK English attitude. English thing. Yeah, they don't, they oh, stiff off uh, uh, just yes, carry on. Uh, hmm. I I'll be very passive aggressive about you not uh, serving me a full pint. That's, I think that's exactly what it is. I will say mildly on nice things about you later this evening to when, my friends. When I, the last time I was in the UK, I ordered a pint, and it was probably one of the worst beers I've ever had. Yeah. Just a diastral bomb, just undrinkable crap. Mm -hmm. Now, in the, in the US, when that happens, I'll take mm -hmm. it back to the bar, say, I don't want to drink this, it is bad, give me a new one, mm -hmm. I'll gladly pay for both. More often than not, they refund you for the first one. Especially if you're not being a Karen. Here, the bartender started fighting with me. He's like, there's nothing wrong with that. It's, yeah. it's bad. I'm yeah. telling you it's bad. I will still pay for it, but mm. give me another beer. He's like, well, if you don't like it, you got to take that up with the brewer. I don't give a yeah. fuck, man. Dump it down the drain. Charge me for both. Just give me a new fucking pint. Mm -hmm. It was a five minute battle just to get a new beer because I said I didn't like it. Yeah. He was personally offended. I've had one of those battles recently. Yeah. 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 It's Did weird. Did you get a battle like that recently? I had a battle. It was just actually with a bartender and um, the glass was dirty as hell. So you had all of this like carbonation creeping up the side of it. Mm -hmm. No head. And I taste I it. I know you've been fighting that for about a year now. I, I have been, I've been fighting this battle different places. Yeah. But this one, this one in particular, like I ordered two of the same beer. Uh, not one was for the wife. I mean, I wasn't just going too fast. Well, but it was the exact same beer. And so one of them was a nice, had a nice head on it. Mm -hmm. And um, the other one was this fucked up dirty glass beer. And you can look at them. You know, they look radically different. It was the, the same, same beer, beer side by side. This yes. one's clearly fucked. And you could taste them. Like the beer that I handed her, you know, I took the bullet on the shitty one, but the shitty one was not drinkable. And same thing. I had this whole argument with the bartender. I mean, I took a sip of it, and I'm like, if you're fucking a remotely competent bartender, you can understand why you would not have served this to me. But it was a whole fight. I don't get it. Yeah. I, I just don't get it. Just take it and throw it away. Yeah. It's fine. Like, it's I not coming out of say, your pocket as a bartender, for fuck's sakes. She gets, she gets in this whole argument with me. Well, I mean, if you don't like the beer, then you can have... I'm like, no, you dumb bitch. I, the beer is fine. I've tasted the beer in a clean glass of three seconds ago. <laughs> Just give me a clean glass beer. Mike, I have to say, as men, we don't say bitch anymore. <laughs> well, take it up with her. <laughs> <laughs> you dumb ass. Anyway. I feel you. I feel you. I, I and, lean to, I think that we just should use it in a... Uh, you know, universally gendered way. Well, speaking of bitches, I mean, I'll call a guy a dumb bitch. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's just funny. <laughs> Do it all the time. <laughs> speaking of bitchy things, moving on to wine news. In wine news, the Sonoma County Airport has officially come out and said, as long as you're traveling through Avela Airlines, which sounds like it's both out of both of our price ranges, mm. you're allowed to check a full case of wine for free in their cargo hold. Which is also out of my price range. <laughs> <laughs> So the next time you're on an expensive wine trip in an expensive county buying expensive wine, yeah. flying on an expensive airline, you too can save $100. I'm going to give you a piece of advice from my personal life. The dumbest possible thing you can do is go to a winery, get a little wine drunk, and buy a case of wine. And you know because what you're going to do when you go to a winery get, and get a little wine get, drunk? You're going to buy a case of wine. And you get it home, like you crack up in a fresh bottle, and you're like, oh my God, this is not good. <laughs> Here in my house, this case of wine that I have is not good wine. I was in Kentucky. Uh, actually, maybe it was Southern Ohio. doesn't matter. Somewhere close to the Kentucky or Southern Ohio border with my in-laws. Shitty wine We went country. to a really crappy winery. Yeah. A lot of fun at the time because we got mm -hmm. tuned up beforehand. Yeah. We got extremely right. tuned up at the right. winery. Mm -hmm. And my mother-in-law left with a case of wine. Mm -hmm. Now, 
tune a week later when they're back home and they bring their wine back home and they yeah. open a bottle and they're like, what the fuck is yeah. this that we just This bought? is clearly different. <laughs> yeah. yeah then, no, it's just the same yeah, crowd. You're just, you're drunk. just yeah, yeah. You're just drunk. Do three shots of tequila before you fucking <laughs> pull the next cork. <laughs> That'll improve it. When we make our own wine brand, we should call it three shots and put a warning on the front. And say, this yeah. is not good unless you have three shots. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, is that Sir, very the, cold. Be a little drunk first. Is that with the, <laughs> night, the night train? Is that how you got into the night train originally? Yeah. Huh. Yeah. Interesting. Yeah. In other words. Yeah, I did actually. When I bought, uh, I got drunk on night train and I bought 10 cases of it at oh the liquor God. store. Damn it. God with a fake it. ID. <laughs> I had them. Uh, I had my town liquor store. I think store. if you had a real ID, they wouldn't <laughs> sell it to you. I, You're buying night train. <laughs> They know what they're they know what they're doing. <laughs> In all fairness, uh, the guy that worked at the liquor store at that period of time, this is a true story. He was a little person who was a magician, and he was the mayor, and oh they god. went to prison oh for god. embezzlement. <laughs> oh my god. <laughs> That's where I'm from. It's like a, I'm like from a David Lynch movie. <laughs> <laughs> god. Mike, I'm <laughs> I don't even it's want to ask story. questions because yes. I don't know where this is going to go and it's not going to be appropriate for you two. So we're just going to move the fuck on. In other wine news, the heralded Wine and Spirits magazine has laid off its entire staff except for its CEO and editor. And he has said, quote, I do not want to stop creating content. I just can't afford these dumb motherfuckers anymore. Meaning now, people who write things? Yes. Yeah. <laughs> so, Mike, how do you make a magazine's worth of content without writers. Hmm. Have you heard of this thing called chat GPT, <laughs> Brett? <laughs> Unfortunately, yes. <laughs> yeah, that's going to be, that's about to become, uh, I don't know that publication to begin with, but it's about to become the worst fucking publication ever. Although, will most people know the difference between derivative nonsense about wine, uh, computer generated versus the idiot generated? Probably not. No, you just stick a number score at the end and people right. are going to be happy. Right. People skip crap. People skip straight to the 85 or 96. I Tastes do. like a wet taint 92 out of 100. Mm -hmm. uh, in spirits news... They hired us. <laughs> That's we're the for sale. Yeah. In spirits news... Uh, this isn't directly spirits news, but I thought it was appropriate to put here... The feds are getting, um, insiders are saying the feds are prepared to announce with the new federal dietary guidelines that no amount of alcohol is safe. Uh, and alcohol watchdogs are starting to freak out because neo-prohibitionist movements are in full swing. Oh my God, I'm definitely going to start stop drinking when that happens. Is this news to you? Yeah. Oh my God. Shit. <laughs> I mean, there's all that bullshit my doctor says, but... If the federal government tells me that alcohol is bad for me, God, I don't know what I'm going to do. As someone who does their own research, I understand. Yeah. Yeah. Hobby distillers have officially gone to court with their case against the federal government through uh, Texas Circuit Court to make home distilling legal. And they're bringing some pretty good arguments to the, uh, to the floor. Hobby distillers. Yes. So like home they distilling. Just, like, the hobbyists. I thought like people make model airplanes and shit. Where, uh, yeah, they're just making they're model liquor in tiny little airport bottles. Yeah, uh, yeah. Their home shelf. But they're yes, basically... We've talked about this a couple times. Like yes. the uh, West Virginia just mm -hmm. said fuck it and legalized it. Mm -hmm. uh, home distilling. You know, just like weed that's yes. still federally illegal. In Texas, they're... Which is uh, crazy to me that Texas is where the legal argument gets made from, but... Yeah, yeah, I don't quite get that either, but uh, they're making sense. They're talking about how home brewing and home winemaking is legal. You can use a home still to make your own fuel. And the whole government, the government case is basically saying, if home distilling is legalized, we're not gonna get our taxes. And these home distillers are basically saying, you let these other things happen at home and you're not worried about collecting your taxes. Why the hell are you worried about spirits? And I think that makes sense. Well, and if we've, as we've discussed in the past, I think that there is a, I think that there's a really good, solid constitutional argument behind it. Because 21st Amendment, the text of the 21st Amendment gives control, specific control on alcohol to states in a way mm. that states don't have, you know, states' rights is a whole broader thing, but it's pretty amorphous in most areas. 
it's different with alcohol. I mean, the 21st Amendment specifically gives states control mm -hmm. over alcohol. So I think that the federal government saying that you can't make moonshine is, uh, is spurious to begin with. So it should come down to the states for a change. Yeah. Mm. I mean, if you want to drink it, that's another... Uh, that's like, on you. Like, like unpasteurized milk. You know, you should have to... Uh, Copy the enter. Yeah. Right. <laughs> if you want to drink unpasteurized milk, do it up. You know, there's a reason we pasteurize it. And uh, But uh, social Darwinism, I'm a big believer. I don't need to get started on a milk pasteurization rant, but I'm definitely prepared to have one. <laughs> sure. <laughs> I mean, <laughs> yeah, I've thrown that down. <laughs> Let's duke it out. Sign up for our Patreon. <laughs> there's going to be a milk rant going live in a couple of weeks. <laughs> it's going to involve Lincoln's mom. It's the whole thing. Abraham Lincoln? Yeah. Oh, God, I can't wait. See, God damn it. <laughs> God damn it. It's true. Pasteurized it's true. milk is just so much better. Mm -hmm. Now, Dewar's workers are getting ready to go on strike. If you're not familiar with Dewar's, it is the worst scotch coming out of Scotland. And the workers are not going on strike because the scotch is shit. It's because the pay is shit. Mike, are you surprised? Dewar's, if you'd like to become a sponsor. <laughs> <laughs> Dewar's, I will butt chug your scotch on air if you decide to be a sponsor, just to show you how delicious your product is and how much it deserves to be Is there savored. a funnel involved in that? <laughs> Depends on what kind of chug you want to do. Uh, I guess not. I mean, I don't know. It's, it's, is it a profitable company? What's the They're issue? A big company. And how and how is pay in Scotland? I mean, they have like all these countries. I, I got to tell you, I got a knee jerk reaction to anybody that lives in a country that where they're not constantly terrified about what healthcare costs, mm. bitching about what they're paid. Uh, I start out with shut the fuck up, but uh, you know. I think it all came down to that the workers wanted a six point two percent raise, and they were not given that. And they were given half of that plus a small bonus, and they said that wasn't enough. Well, it's also something we've hit on here in the past. Inflation sucks. Mm -hmm. uh, we're feeling it in all kinds of ways. We've talked about how it's probably not being measured correctly. But when you do look at the same measurements of inflation, Western Europe versus the United States, it's way worse there. It's a mm -hmm. lot worse there. Mm -hmm. So 6% is probably less than the increased cost of living in Scotland. Oh, for sure. I mean, inflation in the U.S. is 6%. Yeah, and I think inflation over there is more like, I mean, it's double digits. <laughs> yeah, it's it's not great. So I feel for him. Um, Mike, I have a bonus spirit story for you. Have you ever been bored drinking before? You mean like just gotten drunk because I was bored? <laughs> it's done that all the time. No, no, it's Borg. B O R G, Borg. Borg? Yeah, we've both gotten bored drinking before. I That's just common sense. <laughs> Borg know. drinking, though. You ever been Borg what drunk? What is that? Is that? I see like a big monster, green monster. See, What's you, a teach, Borg? you teach kids in Gen Z. It's the Gen Z thing. Blackout Rage Gallon. It's the new jungle juice. But instead of making it in a giant trash can, you're just making a concentrated ver version in a gallon jug and just getting absolutely shit-faced off of one glass. To quote uh, Dr. Lemke, it has a dangerous amount of alcohol in it. Oh, my God. Yeah. We used to make hairy buffalo. It was mm -hmm. a whole... Yeah, yeah. Fresh fruit. Yeah. When I was at OU, we would... Uh, this is completely irrelevant to your story, but we would steal somebody's trash can... And, uh, and clean it out. and like, clean it, like out. clean it really well. Yeah, I'm sure you did. And then we would, uh, you know, make hairy buffalo in it. <laughs> and uh, we drive to West Virginia and we get a bunch of Everclear. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We yeah. make hairy buffalo. It's sanitary. And we get drunk as fuck. And then we would uh, return their trash. Oh, can. God damn it. Clean. You return it. That's so nice. Yeah, yeah. Eighties I mean, wholesomeness. People are just like, uh, why did my trash can disappear and then show up? But it's strikingly clean. Because <laughs> <laughs> we're trash can vigilantes. Yeah, well. This city will be cleaner. <laughs> we will get drunk doing it. <laughs> One trash can at a time. Mike, in other news that's not surprising, the lunch rush is dead. I'm sure you could probably give us a couple reasons why that's the case. 
I'm talking specifically restaurants, obviously. Re this is the retail news segment. We pivoted it quickly. But basically, an article has come out from finance, Yahoo Finance Department saying that lunch time drinking and eating is at all time lows in the US. Well, A, because the office space is dead. The office space is dead. The um, economics are shit. People aren't drinking as much anymore. Yeah, they're drink yeah, also the social acceptability of drinking at lunch even on a Friday, it has uh depressingly plummeted. gone low. Oh yeah, yeah. Yeah. If I can't be halfway day drunk through my job on a Friday afternoon, what's even the point That's of what living? Fridays are for. Like <laughs> yeah. what's the point? Yeah. So that's not surprising to anyone. What is maybe surprising to some, but probably not us, mm -hmm. is the fact that Ohio is looking at eliminating tip wages, which have historically been way depressed because uh, your guaranteed wage as a tip worker is around $5 an hour in Ohio. Tip wages meaning what you can pay a worker who theoretically gets tipped. Yes. And they're looking at raising the minimum to $15 an hour for tip workers. Yeah. Now, surprisingly, the state of Ohio has currently gone up to like five and a quarter. Yeah, five twenty-eight, I think exactly. But surprisingly, tipped workers in Ohio are almost unanimously against this. Ninety-eight percent against well, having their wages raised to fifteen dollars an hour. First of all, so says the bar and restaurant industry. Yeah, that's uh, that's one. Group. So the data where it's coming from is suspect. Mm -hmm. The other thing that's suspect is I'm as sure. That, that when that report was taken and the polling was done, they said, do you want to make tips or do you want to make $15 an hour? Right. Not, do you want to make $15 an hour and still tips? Right. But if you cut that down, yeah, and I've heard like, a, oh, I'm going to have to raise my prices and then my people won't make money. Well, which part, the, the, I don't understand how that math works. I mean, if you're raising prices to fairly compensate workers, then shouldn't tipping go back to like 10%? Like your or workers less. make uh, good money and I tip you 10% like it's Europe or whatever, because that would be fine. I mean, what th this whole, we have bitched about it constantly. We have bitched about it like uh, grumpy older and older men. But um, fucking 25%. I was out last weekend. I went to this bar I had to go to for business reasons. I got two beers. Uh, and with the expected 22% tip plus tax, it's 20 fucking dollars for two beers. Oh, that's stadium pricing. Where, where am I? How am I being more compensated? to spend $10 for a goddamn beer. You know what I would do if I didn't have the tip? Buy an extra beer. Yeah, right. So the prices have gone up and this tipping percentage has gone up. The only thing that I don't understand about it, so pass it, no, that's I'm good all point. for it. Things but, are already going up, so restaurants are making more revenue. Well, I don't know if they're making more revenue because their base costs have gone up. I mean, there has been a lot of supply chain stuff, hmm. but there is also, there was supply chain stuff and prices went up and then a lot of that came back down at least a bit, but prices didn't come back down. You know, prices never go back down, even when your costs go back down. And so servers are really the only people in America that have seen a significant wage increase well, in, in the post COVID era. You know, hilariously enough, Servers' wages being tied to a percentage-based tip means that it sticks with inflation because yeah. it's percentage-based. Right. Which right. is goddamn hilarious and sad at the same time. Yeah. I mean, it's. I was a bartender for a lot of years. I am very pro-bartender server. I'm just not pro being, uh, you know, financially assaulted when I go to a bar. Because I want to enjoy going to a bar. I don't. I don't want it to feel like I just walked out of getting a fucking home loan. You know, it. Uh, it feels worse too now that everything requires tips. Yes. When, like you would go out to a restaurant, and you'd expect oh, a tip. God, right. You'd go out to a bar, you'd expect a tip. But now, if I get my car towed, I'm not tipping the fucking tow man. No. I had to say no on a tip selection for getting my car towed the other yeah. day. You have to say no for going to get do pickup. 
Like takeout yes. was the way you get around that shit. Yeah. And now it's like, now I get glares if I hit no on tipping. Like yeah. I'm picking up, I'm doing the work here. Get the hell out of here. I stood in line for a half an hour at Potbelly the other day to get a sandwich. And the, they asked me how much I want to tip at the end. Uh, and I was like, well, God damn it. Okay, I'll how tip How much I want to, zero. I'll, but. I'll tip 10% uh, for this takeout food because it's not, it's not a tipping nobody's given me service other than right. uh so you know i tipped like 10 percent where i should be tipping nothing and uh and she you know turns it around and uh yeah i get the glare you still get, get the like, glare you I get, get the like, glare i get the, like the shit look that's Fuck off your pop belly i you i shouldn't be tipping you that's the other thing i hate about that electronic forced interaction yeah. fucking thing like you get to see my tip amount before i leave at least with like a paper bill, you can fill out the tip and get the fuck out before they see it. Like I'll just, I'll just start pressing buttons so they can't see how much I tipped anymore. Even if I give a good tip, because I just don't want to have that interaction. I don't want you to look at me like I did a good job because tipping you feels like I just got robbed. And I don't want you to look at me like I'm an asshole when I under tip you, under tip, if it's a fucking takeout order. Right. I don't want any of that. You're not supposed to be, because those people are actually not part of that. If you're working at Jersey Mike's, you're you should already be being paid at least uh you should be being paid more but you should be paying at least the minimum wage for everybody except servers and bartenders yes now there are businesses that have used that loophole and fuckery for a long time but all this goes back to uh it goes back to the 1960s actually and the restaurant lobby back then when they passed minimum wage laws the restaurant mm. lobby was so powerful that they got restaurant workers opted out of minimum wage laws. So on a federal level, I think that not only does it suck, but it's still locked in at like 1960-something wages. Jesus I think Christ. federal minimum wage for servers and bartenders is still like it's like a dollar something or something. It's really cheap. Yeah, it's it's under three dollars an hour. Yes. And I, and as somebody who has worked as bartender a lot, like in younger days, um, although shit, I might go back to it because it, uh, it probably pays better than what we're doing. Pay, it pays better than being a college professor. I'll tell you that. But like, you'd have that downtime, and you know, there's some dickhead manager. It's like, uh, go roll silverware, and you know, go clean this or that, and whatever. If you got time to lean, you got time to clean. Yeah, and, and you're getting paid like uh, to do that shit. You're getting paid like a third of what even base minimum wage is, which is garbage to begin with. Yeah, whatever. I support it. I support one. I support paying servers and bartenders like everybody else, and bringing the tip percentage back into reasonable range. I'd be cool with, yes, $15 an hour and get those tip prices down to 5 to 10%. Yeah. Hell and quit, yeah. And quit having to tip uh, everybody for everything. All right. Yeah, I, like I always, I, I used to like to for the server to know what I was tipping because I've always been like a big tipper because I did come out of that industry. But now that... I'm expected to pay 25% and the price of everything has gone up dramatically. I, fuck off. Well, speaking of fucking off, Mike, we wrote a book. We did write a book. Why don't you I tell us you a, a copy of well, it. Why don't you tell us about it for a second while I get another beer? Yeah, do that. This book is the best book since... <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, that's pretty good, though, actually. We uh, did it. We wrote this one in interview style, uh, although there was a massive amount of editing in that process. So we interview like some of, the, of our uh, inspirations and, and people with just like great stories in the brewing industry. So it's Cincinnati-based, but it also is really kind of a universal message around craft beer. Tank to Cincinnati is the name of it. Uh, you can buy it on the link below. Please buy it there as opposed to like that place that makes Bezos rich and just rips us off. Truth. All right. Yeah. Let's move on to our final story. Social? How's the stock doing? <laughs> Skip on. <laughs> <laughs> now, we are approaching 
record levels of length on this podcast episode. So we're going to dive into the main story and let you guys know about what is going on in the consolidative world of beer. There's some crazy shit happening. And uh, I guess I should say before we really get into this, if you haven't listened to the Bruce Guys Happy Hour podcast, we do a whole series of the history of craft beer, but we also do a little mini season where we talk about kind of uh, beer post um, uh, prohibition. And there's this whole consolidated period. And I think that by listening to that, you'll understand a lot more of what's happening today, and especially with the news stories that we are about to get into, how all of this kind of seems like it's coming around again. Yeah. We also do on the podcast a three series episode of the interview with Jim Cook, which is relevant to this as well. That is true. Mm-hmm. So, uh, in beer news, and Jim Cook is interviewed in this book, Brett. Oh yeah, he is. in Cincinnati. He sure is. Yeah. Um, if you order a copy of our book, you may get a copy signed by Jim Cook. Yeah. Probably not. That's possible. <laughs> <laughs> No, <laughs> we hang out. I mean, uh, he only invites me over Thanksgiving, Brett. Now, but he uh, does. Oh yeah, I mean, I go there every year. We get. I, uh, I only get handies at Oktoberfest from him. See, <laughs> <laughs> I don't want pumpkin pie. <laughs> oh my God, the chance to see him! I am sponsoring Bruce guys. Just fucking fun. <laughs> <laughs> so Sapporo bought Stone. We all know that. Now, it's been speculated, why did they buy, blah, blah, blah. There's still not a lot known in, through the consumer market uh-huh. of why Sapporo's making these investments. Well, Sapporo's announced that the expansion plans at Stone's San Diego uh, facility, which is their main facility, are almost complete. And you might be thinking to yourself, fuck yeah, Stone, American craft beer, mm. you know, fighting the, the big brewers and all that stuff. They got an expansion going. It's going to be more Stone for more of us that's more fresh more often. Wrong. It's solely to make more Sapporo. You're going to drink Japanese swill and you're going to fucking like it. It's disgusting beer. We, we kind of shot it up that one we episode, didn't we? We shot it up. We shot it up. We have Check our YouTube we... channel out. Yeah. You can see that. Uh, Mike does a whole thing with a gun. <laughs> <laughs> Which is more fun than most of the YouTube. Like, a random idiot does a thing with a gun. That's true. Uh, <laughs> so my question well, for you on the Sapporo thing, though, is... <laughs> Sapporo, to me, Sapporo's doing this strategically because they see the value yeah. of imports in the U.S. right now. The yeah. only thing that's growing is imports. People think they're fancy. They have ever since the fucking 80s right. when people thought Stella and Heineken were fancy. And some people still do. But you juxtapose that against the fact that Lagunitas Brewery, who sold out to Heineken, just closed down and or just announced that they're closing down at the end of June the mm-hmm. Chicago uh, brewery that Lagunitas built because obviously sales aren't going that well. Do you think that Sapporo, by growing the Stone Brewery, is actually going to have success with the strategy of more Japanese imports? trying to pile off the back of these Mexican imports that are doing so well? I'd love to say no, but I, I, I don't think it's a bad strategy, actually, because people are stupid. And um, when we did shoot up Sapporo cans, one of the things that we learned from that is that, um, well, they're really fun to shoot. They do, uh, you know, they spiral and things. And it's they're because they're steel. Because they're steel. So the the cans are cool, like the, the they you know, are cool cans. They, they are cool cans. They're, they're these very interesting uh, cans, and the beer is is just vile, but uh, mm. it's very light bodied, and it has that you know it, it has very heavy rice taste, which Bud Light drinkers will immediately understand, because well, when when I drink Bud Light, like that's all I taste is the rice in it. Well, what about the gayness? Do you taste that? Of, of the Bud Light? Ooh, yeah. Oh, yeah, absolutely. <laughs> okay, good. Yeah, I do too. That's why I hate it. Yeah. <laughs> no, I taste the rice. And, uh, Sapporo, a less gay Bud Light. Yeah. <laughs> I'm yeah, sure Brett's, this episode's going to do really well for Brett's, us. Brett, huh? Yeah. Is there another bridge we can burn? <laughs> <laughs> Something else we can set fire to. Oh my god, I haven't been canceled yet somehow. You know who I hate more than gay people? <laughs> Women. <laughs> oh, 
All right. <laughs> Enough. Uh, <laughs> it is. It is. Bud Light, Budweiser is a rice. It uses rice as an adjunct. So Sapporo is a very unapologetically rice beer. But it's it's the it's the thing. It's not. There's not some bullshit stereotype going on there. It's a rice beer. Uh, a lot of the world does that, and Asia in particular, because they produce a lot of rice. So it's a cheaper grain than barley, and the climate is better for it. I hate the taste of that. I think that a rice. I think rice beers are disgusting. I actually, and Bud really Light is a rice lagers. I had I one. Our, I our our friend uh, Dan up at Gravel Road, Middletown, Ohio, he actually made this rice beer, and he was like, "Oh, taste this." I made this rice beer, drank it, and I drank it to be polite rather than tell him to go fuck himself. And it was really a nice. There was subtlety to it. Uh, it, it was a nice beer, but uh, that's because he's a great brewer. Sapporo is not. Is the point? Is it's disgusting beer. It's not going to succeed on the fact that it's a good beer. It's a good liquid, but neither is Modelo, and they're selling the shit out of that. Can we so, go back two minutes really quick? I just want to say. I think this is the first time on this show that I made you uncomfortable instead of no, the reverse. And I no, think I think no. that that's worth I think that was worth noting. I think that was good. You were the this is the first time you've reined me in. Yeah. It goes back a while, but I don't know. There was uh, an episode where you were talking about masturbating in a car. <laughs> oh was, God. Was yeah. Very, okay. That was, that was a Christmas episode, wasn't it? <laughs> <I don't know. laughs> <laughs> well, getting jolly yeah, for Santa. Yeah, whatever. Now, this episode's getting very <laughs> long. So we're going to jump quickly to the Boston beer uh, story, which is really the meat and potatoes of this whole episode. We just took 37 minutes to get here. Now, Boston beer is in a very unique position. Mm. One, they're making lots of money. Doggy style. About 30. <laughs> and you just, you just got, it's just got to go back the other way, right? The balance has been thrown off. Yeah. There's an imbalance I in the fall. I fell a challenge. <laughs> 3.6 <laughs> billion a year is about what a uh, revenue that Boston Beer has. Yeah. One billion of that is Twisted Tea. Very similar. Modified. They're at five-year lows for their stock price, around three hundred dollars, when they were up around twelve hundred during the pandemic. Yeah, and um, they it was are, inflated then. It was definitely inflated, but they are having an amazing success in FMBs, RTDs, and they have cannabis. Working in the wings. Mm -hmm. It hasn't been released yet. It's coming. Don't Talk worry. about that. See, man, I was about to become the biggest weed dealer in the United States. Yep, yeah, yep. Yeah. And trust us, it is coming. Inside information. I know we don't do scoops very often, but this is definitely a scoop. Now, the other important thing about this whole situation with Sam Adams is, one, they're publicly traded. And, two, they have no debt and record cash flows. So, put all this together. They're crushing their business. They have no debt. They have record cash flows, and the stock price is at all-time lows. Now, does that not sound like fucking hostile takeover territory or what? Town sounds like hostile takeover territory. And Heineken and Molson Coors, both independently, both unattributed and both unverified, mm -hmm. however, are very much rumored to be looking at hostile takeover as a Boston beer, given their very, very unique position. Now, the only thing we can say to you, the listener exactly here, is that investing in Boston beer, while this isn't financial advice, is something that if I had spare money, I would probably do. And also when you say inside information, to be clear, you know, that's not. <laughs> <laughs> we know Jim Cook, we don't know him that well. <laughs> You've heard things in the industry. <laughs> not, uh, yeah, yes. Huh. Uh, yeah, Martha Stewart. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> um, that would be so ironic when in part of this uh, interview we do Jim Cook in the book Tank Cincinnati which makes a great gift for everything he it talks about the fact like the hostile takeover of Anheuser-Busch and it definitely I mean the hostile takeover of Anheuser-Busch definitely happened due to incompetence mm-hmm Jim Cook is definitely not incompetent, but I'm also not clear what he runs. What I know is that part of what kept Boston Beer a really good, solid company and kept the beer good 
was that when they went public back in whenever the hell it was, the early like 90s, 90, or 92 or something. Uh, part of the agreement, part of the operating agreement <coughs> of the company, was that Cook had like basic veto power yeah. over any significant decision. Osama bin Cook. <laughs> yeah. That's their next beer. <laughs> <laughs> it, it um, I'm good. So I don't know if that's still, I don't know if it's still the case or not. But I mean, in theory, their operating agreement at that period of time it gave Jim Cook the ability to quash that type of uh, uh, agreement. But he also doesn't own 51% of the stock. So I, I don't know what he controls mm. and what he does control, you know, or, or, or what their control structure is. But it would suck. Sam Adams already is kind of depressing. Yes. Uh, because it... 80% of their business is not beer. Yeah. And all their development and innovation is not beer. Yes. But Jim Cook loves beer, and they still support beer. Yes, right. They were diehard craft beer yeah. fans, and it yeah. shows. And they even stopped doing, like, one of the things that made Sam Adams what it was as a beer is this deconcoction brewing, which is a whole pain in the ass, complicated process. Um, they quit doing that recently uh, to cost cut cost, I assume. Nobody's noticed. But was that it? <laughs> it uh, <I> <laughs> Our director Dan's digging around with things. I don't. <laughs> I got distracted. The, the yeah, I mean, we need to wrap this up. But the point is that they have they have been doing things that are inconsistent with the original vision of Sam Adams. When you talk, when you sit down and talk to Jim Cook, he really does still clearly believe in the revolution of craft beer, of, you know, the independence and the quality and, and all of those things. Uh, and it would be incredibly depressing to see it, see a hostile takeover of Boston beer. But it would also be incredibly depressing to see America's first craft brewery anchor steam bought by some greed head shit bag uh, Japanese Sapporo motherfuckers and then shut down. So there are, there are uh, consistent trends in beer and, and there's definitely consistent trends right now in the yeah. American economy, global economy, but you know, America in particular is letting oligopolies and monopolies happen again. And it's not, it's going to just give a shittier beer. Yeah, I don't really know what to add to that, so I'm not gonna I'm not gonna add anything. Am, uh, but it is, yeah. I think you summed it up well. I think Jim Cook is uh, the Batman of beer, uh, craft beer specifically. Uh, what what's the saying? You uh, you either die the hero or live your uh, live long enough to see yourself become the villain. And I think that's uh, that's kind of where they're headed. Not by his own choice, though. Yeah. Well, I mean, definitely with your like handy uh, comments. I mean, we're not going to his house Thanksgiving, so thanks for that, you fucking dick. Well, I'll see you at Oktoberfest, <laughs> Jim. Cheers.